Welcome back, everyone. We are up to the last panel discussion, but it's not the last activity of today. Coming up in this panel discussion, uh, it is the discussion on the food security in crisis, the, the impact of COVID-19 on farmer, their produce, and our food organized by the Alternative Agriculture Network and Grant. The panel will be discussed about the issues that are very close to our everyday life, which is about food. But we don't usually heard much about what exactly happened to the farmer and the way they produce food for uh, us during this uh, crisis times. And we hope that the, to hear all of this uh, from the panel today. So now, can I invite Kun King Kong, a moderator of this panel on the screen? So, what is up, Kun King Kong? Good afternoon. So, Thank you. Good afternoon. Good inviting me. Thank you. So, Kun King Kong is a deputy director of BioTai, a Thai NGO working with networks of small farmers and disseminating information on sustainable agriculture biodiversity and the farmers and community rights. She's a coordinator of Food for Change advocacy campaign to push for recognition and the support of small scale food producer and seller in the Thai food systems. So we are lucky to have Kun Kinkel with us today uh, to moderate this final and important panel. So Kun Kinkel, I over the floor to you. Thank you, Terry, for the introduction and good Sunday afternoon, everyone, friends and comrades, and all the speakers. I'm so delighted that we can make it here in the afternoon as I'm on my way also to, to Bangkok and stop along the way. And now we have around 26 participants and also I think there's a lot of people are watching live also. This is, I think this is the third day of uh, this meal. I, I think everyone would be familiar with this meal. Meal is a cat, but I think this, this is MACO, Asian Environmental Weeks 2021. And this is the third session for the third day. And this is very important as Jerry has already said, as already mentioned that it's all about everyone. It's all about food. And in Thailand, we eat more than three meals a day before, but by now maybe a little less. We have here with us four representative four speakers from different countries. We have Sokhit Heng, who's from Cambodia. I think Sokhit would introduce himself also. He's working with the, I think, the coordination forum in Cambodia. So, so yeah, yeah. Late, late. Uh, and also we have uh, Fitri Amir from uh, Malaysia. He's also work on uh, food sovereignty and food security issues. And yeah, hello. And hello. And Lasela from Indonesia. I think she's been working with the indigenous community on food sovereignty, food security, and we'll discuss the issues on food estate. I think now we have to, and also Kunubon Kakubon is still here already. I haven't seen, I didn't see, Kun, I don't, I don't see Kunubon. Kiyobon Maliyang, ha? Kiyobon. Sang you, kap, kap, okay. Oh, Kiyobon. I may end with Kunubon. Okay, and okay. Kunubon, okay. Kunubon Yuang, Kiyubon Naka from uh, Sustainable um, Alternative Agriculture Network in the north, northeastern of Thailand. Now he's in Yesothan province. So we have to agree among us who is going to start and who is going to be second, third, and last. Everyone will have the first round of 10 minutes, and then we can have the second round after Q&A and also comments or discussion and anyone everyone feel free to to write the question or comments in the chat box and i can 
read during the question and answer session. So who is going to start? Okay, I will designate them. So, shall we start from, um, I would like to start from Cambodia. Can I? So, sure. we, we are going to discuss about what's happening exactly in, in the, our community, in society, or as the, also, you can discuss at the national level what's happening. What is the impact of this COVID-19 epidemic to food production, to the small scale farmers, to food system? And also what is the uh, kind of adaptation practicing that's been doing by the small scale farmers? And what is the, uh, maybe you can also mention about the impact on, on consumer in general also. As the consumer, consumer when they, when they say consumer, meaning the one who cannot produce food themselves, mm -hmm. but everyone consume, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, okay, I will give the first word. I give the floor to Sakit, please. Okay, thanks, uh, King Khan, and good afternoon again uh, to the moderators and uh, my friends here who are the speakers, and also everyone in in the Zoom and also welcome to uh, the audience, like the people who are uh, listening and following our uh, live broadcast. I'm uh, Suchit Heng from Cambodia, currently with the Cambodian Grassroots Transactor Network. We are actually working to, to connect uh, communities from different sectors. And because Cambodia, uh, the main population of Cambodia are farmers, so most of our uh, members in the network are uh, farmers. So we basically and mainly really work uh, with the farmers. And for today' uh, discussion, I'm actually guided uh, uh, by by the organizers to to share the. Uh, the, the experience and issues uh, happening to Cambodian farmers, uh, uh, specifically on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, small farmers and we can say small food producers. Um, before uh, going to the presentation, I would like to apologize that I'm, I'm going to present my, my presentation in, in Khmer. Uh, but I, I do have a, a PowerPoint in English, which I will share the screen uh, soon now, uh, because I'm I'm actually uh, familiar with the uh, uh, with my uh, language and people here, especially the farmers who are we are working with, is still uh, so many of them are on on the streamline, and uh, also would like to uh, to say uh, to listening to the the talk, my talk also. Uh, let me share the, the slide presentation, then I will talk in, in, in Khmer. Can I check uh, if the, the screen is here? King Kong? Yes, in, yes. The, okay. the, but it's in English, you said you will put the... I mean, I will, I will uh, show this the presentation, presentation uh, the screen English, but then I will talk in Khmer. Okay. Okay. Do we have that interpretation? Yes. Okay. Jang som chim biep sua mat tang ac khnie mat phe tang hat dam ban hai nang pu minh bong on sa cum ca si co phong dai chi pe se pu minh dai cam pung tai tam dan so dap ket pi sa. เอ่อในเวทนาสัปดาห์เอ่อเมกุงอาเซียนเอ่อสดายอัมพีปาริธานให้ทั้งนี้ท่องได้ខ្ញុំមាន
Situation of COVID-19, the impacts on our small farmers or uh, small producers or household producers in Cambodia. As uh, in summary, uh, my presentation, uh, I will discuss six points. First, I'm talking about the situation of uh, Cambodian farmers. And I would like to take this opportunity to talk about the, uh, 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 to compare the situation of farmers in the past and how uh, this situation has changed in the current situation. Uh, two, I'm talking uh, briefly about the COVID-19 situation in Cambodia, how it uh, breaks and spreads in Cambodia, uh, Cambodia the population has received information about the pandemic, so I'm not going to detail. And three, I'm talking about the impacts of COVID-19 on Cambodian small farmers uh, based on the results of uh, and findings of the uh, research of multi-sectoral network and our NGO uh, for uh, uh, community and development and active research team from uh, the focus on Global South in Cambodia. For I'm going to uh, share with you government responses and interventions uh, to prevent and contain the spread of the COVID-19. Five, I'm going, as our research is uh, focused on our farmers' uh, situation. So in the situation of COVID-19, what do our farmers have to protect ourselves or ensure their livelihoods? Uh, finally, I will make some recommendations and suggestion <laughs> that our farmers have brought to share with the government for consideration and solution. My presentation, I try to be short, and I try to summarize it, uh, giving the opportunities to all uh, participants to listen and give further comments on the situation and the impacts. As our moderator mentioned, if you have additional comments, please type in those comments uh, on Facebook's live stream. Then the moderator, moderator will summarize your questions or rephrase your questions if necessary. Now, uh, let's come to the first part of my presentation. First, I'm going to talk about the Cambodian farmer situation. I, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to compare the past, uh, what it happened at that time and how it looks like now. Uh, the past situation uh, includes uh, land, land and natural resources for our farmers in the past uh, our land was secure and safe no violation no destruction no pollution uh, to the soil quality and natural resources were uh, rich and abundant uh, now many cambodian citizens are facing land disputes uh, through uh, land violations by concessionaires our concession companies and the powerful and our natural resources are facing severe and massive destruction. Uh, secondly, the data of our farmers in the estimation by the, the Ministry of Agriculture, they conducted a study in 2013. They saw that there are up to two, up to 82 
percent of uh, Cambodian population are farmers, but uh, only 47 percent own less than one hectare. So more than half are small farmers or uh, small food producers. Up to date, the number of farmer has decreased uh, in relation to land situation. Agricultural land is held by big companies and uh, rich, uh, wealthy people. Rich uh, and wealthy companies owned bigger land size and our farmers uh, lose more land. Three, uh, I would like to talk about farm, farming practice in the past. Our farmers did not use uh, chemical fertilizers or pesticide. They only used uh, a traditional or natural fertilizer, compost, and traditional farming system and they use animals as labor for agriculture. Uh, but currently uh, their farming uh, has uh, changed uh, significantly from natural uh, practice to heavy chemical substance and most chemical substance affects animal health, environment and natural resources and agricultural pesticide uh, are important. They are not locally produced. And the current situation is that the government of Cambodia and uh, Cambodian society are promoting uh, agricultural modernization. In the past, our farmers used uh, traditional farming equipment now they have changed but gradually they have shifted to machinery uh, walking tractors and tractors in the past our farmers own lands own seeds and knowledge uh, of agriculture and the whole farming process they own uh, these aspects uh, but currently uh, private and corporation uh, control, the private and corporation control, and they have already control uh, seeds, uh, market resources, and agricultural knowledge and techniques. Another aspect is uh, expense on or the cost of farming in the past uh, was very little or there was almost no cost. Instead, currently, uh, the cost of production is very high because our farmers have started to rely on inputs from private companies, corporation, including seeds and pesticide. And also the quality of soil in the past for uh, farming was high, the quality of uh, soil was very high. អឺនៃលំហូដីល្បាប់សម្រាប់បង្កើតជាជីធម្មជាតិផងដែរអញ្ចឹងពេលដែលបាត់បងទុនធាតុធម្មជាតិក៏ <coughs> បាទថាទេប៉ុន្តែផ្ទុយទៅវិញបច្ចុប្បន្ន
cả sự to pi pi chấm nón đá ấm pi pi tại tất cả cứ mình miền bầm nón thì bà cứ quạt ở miền bầm nón lại cái chôn thế bàn tay sàn tiệp bạch chấm bòn đấy cứ tôi khó sờ lại tại mà đòn cứ cứ chỉ miền bầm nón lại bầm nón nâng mình men chia lại cái nạp bầm nón thòm bạch đá thế cứ pu mình cả sự coi những cả sự coi không ai những thị trấn còn tha chia bầm nón tiệp tiệp và mình thì tha rùa hoa rót ngay khom bằng bảy thứ cả sự cam cọ bò rót ngay cứ đầm bầy tại đọt bầm nón và hãy đọt nâng mình nghe nâng mình nghe nâng ót tiệp là cứ vòn cọ tới vòn cọ tới chấm nói sầm khan một tiệp đái cứ cả sự coi những cứ miền và bắt thoa này cả chạy đầm lệ hay sam kỳ khné khăng này chạy chui khné từ bên từ mỏ đại tôi bị than bị bắt chấm bón cứ miền cà bạc cụt bị chế hay nâng Hello. Uh, yes, uh, I, think, con? I think we don't have English translation now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, just two minutes ago. And I think you may have to also watch because we have, you, you have used already two minutes. I give you another two minutes, please. How many minutes more? Um, you have 10 minutes more, okay? 10 minutes. And yep. there's no English interpreter? In, no, no, there's no. There's, yeah. okay. Okay, we'll try to be short. Okay, then King Khan, I can still continue in in Khmer, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's try. Let's check with the Khmer interpreter. Ah. So. Yeah. Now Khmer is joining in this group. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. Maybe he he was cut off. เอ่อภาษาโรคจําเนี่ยบอกปรายจีภาษาอังกฤษโอเคอีทิงฮีสเฮียร์ชานาไรท์อาร์ยูเฮียร์เยสโอเคโอเคสุดยอดโอเคบ
chúng ta 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 chúng the impact in particular from from this pandemic to the small scale farmers and food production or food security in general and because we have very very limited time now okay i i so it's not not 10 minutes anymore it's two yes. or five now, minutes <laughs> now it's five minutes already <laughs> okay so i will skip some slide uh, yeah, you can okay. come back later okay uh kata but i still can talk in khmer right uh jana the interpreter disconnect please talk in english yep uh, okay ba som to pu meng dai da san ne bok prae chi pisa khmer tau ong le nang kwat dach bat jang nyom nang banto bot ban han nyak nyom chi pisa ong le na ba hay Okay, so the, the cost of the chain, I would like to finish a few points in regard to the cost of the chain. Here is uh, uh, happening in Cambodia, the government has uh, has adopted the policy paper on the promotion of paddy production and dry export and some degree on contract farming. And there's also industry policies which liberalize and uh, modernize agricultural sector in Cambodia. And the other important point, we I would like to highlight also the government of Cambodia, uh, specifically the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, Agriculture want to adopt uh, another pro-capitalist agricultural land draft law, but later on it's being uh, cancelled after uh, the farmer movement again the draft. Because uh, time is uh, running out, so I, I, I would not mention the, the next slide in regard to the COVID yeah, because yeah. Uh, we can easily yeah. find out in the, in the news. Yes. I will go to specifically the impact, the current impact of COVID-19 on Cambodian farmers. I would highlight uh, uh, six main uh, issues in impacts. First, it really impacts to livelihood and occupation. Uh, the second one is on health. Uh, on, on livelihood, I mean, uh, uh, the, the people have facing of uh, food shortage and the income has been lost uh, because uh, uh, of their production are not be able to truly really, uh, sell out. And this mostly affect to those uh, farmers who are farming for, uh, for, for market purpose. But for the small scale farmer who are producing food for local consumption, for family consumption, uh, they have affect less. And the occupation also, uh, not only the farmers, but their, their children who are having additional job to, to earn income to support the family, they also lost their opportunity to find additional income. And health, uh, uh, farmer are affected because uh, some farmer really got uh, affected by COVID and they are so concerned and some uh, farmer does have uh, what we call a mental, mental health because they are living with isolation, they are concerning every day, they are afraid of being affected by the COVID. And uh, the third impact is in regard to food um, and water. As I mentioned earlier, because uh, of the uh, the market and the for the shortage of uh, of fa some farmer really having a shortage of food uh, and water because uh, uh, in regard to do to the waters uh, many area has been uh, privatized so people need to spend uh, money for waters so when the income has has uh, decreased then uh, it's really affect. Uh, for their capacity and afford to, to buy food and to buy waters. About the debt, uh, it really impact on debt. Actually, farmer have uh, have have got into debt for before even before the COVID, but because of the COVID, the the debt is becoming uh, more serious, uh, becoming slow debt, and farmer need to borrow uh, a few uh, a few. Uh, micro finance and even from the private lenders 
so that that is becoming very complicated and very hard to to pay so it's becoming a, a very bondage and and, and slow slavery debt the impact the mainly impact is also on human rights and abuse. okay <clears throat> okay so yeah sorry for interrupting again i think i i would like to ask you to stop right here first and then you can come back next round um, okay. to, to discuss further more on the impact and the solution because you have to spend so so almost 25 minutes i, I need to give the floor to others okay okay Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Um, So I would like to give the floor to, I, I will not uh, summarize anything. I would like to give the floor next to Amir. Please, Amir. So now everyone would have 50 minutes as, as uh, so Kiet already used 25 minutes. Sorry for that. Okay, the first year is Amir. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, All right. Anyone okay. hear what I said? Okay. Okay. I, I think it's uh, it's okay now. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kim Kwan. Uh, I will not take uh, so much time. Uh, actually, uh, I doesn't prepare any slides. So, uh, fifteen minutes. Uh, I will uh, directly uh, focusing on the, the COVID-19 and uh, its it uh, effect to farmers and agriculture. Uh, so the backgrounds uh, uh, given on the uh, agriculture in, in Cambodia is actually uh, quite similar to what ha uh, happening in, in other countries, I think. Uh, here in Malaysia, uh, I mean, the, the background issues, yeah? The background issues like uh, land consolida consolidation, like uh, the small farmers having taken uh, their land uh, to make way for large estates, and uh, the control, the, the monopoly of seeds, the monopoly of inputs, and also the pricing is not fair. I think that is that is uh, that is uh, the problems ha happening everywhere uh, to the small farmers uh, in the world. But uh, I would like to, uh, before that, I would like to thank and uh, congratulate the, organi the organizer uh, because uh, actually uh, this discussion is this is this discussion is an important topic uh, because indeed COVID nineteen is actually has brought an awareness uh, to all of us that uh, the agricultural system that we are building now uh, by the countries now is actually. Uh, uh, fragile uh, system. Uh, I will. Uh, I would like to uh, link uh, food security uh, uh, with the issues of COVID nineteen. So, uh, uh, the definition of food security uh, is is the state of having uh, reliable access to sufficient quantity of uh, affordable and nutritious foods. So, in this case, there are uh, three factor. Uh, three factor that form. Uh, food security, namely the availability of the food, uh, the access to the food, uh, and also the affordability uh, to the food, whether people can buy it or not. So uh, during the COVID-19 infection, so Malaysia, Malaysia is one of the country that have uh, the highest numbers in South Asia uh, of, of COVID-19 cases. So the action to curb uh, COVID-19 is also quite strong. So Malaysia has implemented the movement control order. Uh, that means uh, no one is allowed to leave their house. And uh, if there is an important matter, uh, one only can go out in a 10 kilometer radius of an area. So uh, later on, this law was reduced uh, to cross districts uh, restrictions and then a cross, uh, cross uh, states uh, restriction. So uh, since farming is an essential sector, the farmers are still allowed uh, to do their works as usual, uh, to producing foods. Uh, so this part, the availability of the, the food, the availability part uh, of the food security is not much problem. But when it's come to the accessibility 
and affordability, so the problem rise. So the problem is because there are so many uh, restrictions, so many roadblocks. So harvest uh, cannot be sent to consumer on time. So uh, resulting in many fruits, uh, many vegetables and also fish. So being dumped by the wholesaler and it's become a waste. So it has, it has become an issue here in Malaysia. So uh, the answer is why they are dumping food instead of donate it, for example. So uh, this wholesaler said that the transportation cost to donate this, this, uh, this harvest will make them uh, losses more. So this is the problem of accessibility. So uh, later the price of uh, vegetables in the city went up. So causing some residents not to be able to afford it. So coupled with uh, many people losing their job, uh, COVID-19 is not just affecting farmers, but also workers. Uh, uh, many people are losing job uh, because uh, close, uh, a, a shop are closed, uh, factory are closed. Yeah? So there are affordability problem uh, is clearly visible. Yeah? So for imported food items, so, so the problem is even greater. When some countries actually implement uh, export ban, and shipping movement uh, uh, between countries is also affected. So, as a result to uh, uh, to this COVID nineteen infection, so so the, the cycle does not stop here. So finally, uh, at the uh, at first, I say that the farmers uh, actually doesn't have a problem to produce their food because they are still allowed to to work. But uh, finally, now after almost two years uh, almost of uh, movement control order, and many economic activity now has been resumed, so we can see an increase uh, in the cost of agricultural input. So this is new. This is, this is a new problem. So the agricultural uh, input recently has been uh, rise uh, as much as 50%. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the price of uh, seeds, the price of fodder, the price of machines, spare part. So all of this, uh, because all of this, most of it is a source from abroad, a source from overseas. So as a result, the food prices also rose uh, sharply. So uh, lastly, uh, what can we learn from here? What can we learn from here? So we can see that the, this current supply chain system, the modern uh, current supply chain system is actually uh, fragile. So what we, what we should do is to decentralize yeah, and build uh, the, the supply chain system that, that uh, as close as we can within our community. Uh, for example, the, currently, so the, the vegetables planted in Northern Malaysia, yeah, will need to be brought to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and then after uh, centralizing Kuala Lumpur, uh, then it will go back to the north to be uh, distributed. Uh, so that is the current system. I mean, the, the transportation system, the, the input system, it, it is, uh, I think it is not sustainable enough. So I think that's, that, that's all for now. Uh, I will resume. Uh, the action should be taken uh, by us uh, in, the, in the second part of this uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Amir. You have made a very important point when, when talking about the uh, food accessibility, meaning a very, very important part also of the food security uh, um, element. Okay, I, I, I will not summarize or discuss anything now. I will. I will move to the next speaker. So let, let us hear from uh, Indonesia. Asela, are you ready? Yeah. The, the yes, yours. Yeah. yeah, can I share the screen? Okay. Yeah, let me speak in uh, Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, yeah, terima kasih semua. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me as one of the panelists uh, today. And my name is Rasella from Yayasan Pusaka, and I 
want to share here about the theme that also related with the big theme in Mekong as an environmental week 2021. The topic is about COVID-19 and investment, land-based large-scale investment in Indonesia as a deadly combination against the food sovereignty. So this is a story from West Papua. Why Papua? Because I, in Pusaka, my concerns, my focus is in Papua. So this is uh, very close to me and I can share with you. Well, before I start and before I explain how COVID-19 has posed lots of severe impacts towards the first sovereignty, especially in Papua, I would like to share with you also to all of you about what are the local food potentials that Papua has? Well, majority of the people, we consume rice. But, well, before Papua's populations were introduced to rice, they themselves had their own local food resources based on the data of the uh, Ministry of Agriculture Indonesian. Indonesia has the largest sago land area, around 6.5 million hectares of sago. 95% is located in Papua, and it's one of huge potential that Papua has. And Papua, in this case, they, they have a custom which we call food diversification. They do not only, they didn't only consume one specific uh, particular items as the carbohydrate sources. They have others alternatives. So they do not only recognize one specific source of carbs sources, not only rice, as rice has just been introduced to them before they consumed patatas. Patatas is, it's like a, a taro and a plantain. And patatas or taro, there are so many types of uh, the taro, the white one, the yellow, the purple one, and also kasbi. Kasbi is almost like cassava and also kumbili. And these are the types of their staple food. For example, they would consume fish with plantain, chicken with plantain and others. And the sources are in the forest. Forest is the main source of balanced nutrition because the way of life of the people there is hunting and gathering. So the main activity are taking place in the forest, in the jungle. So forest is the central and pivotal living space or living realm of the Papuan people. So this is the phenomena. As an introduction for us all here to understand more about Papua and what would happen next, what will happen next. I just came back from the field with my colleagues. So this is like, this is like the way, the process of sago making. There cutting down the sago and then uh, chop it into a smaller parts and then and like smash or crush the sago into a bits, tiny bits of pieces. And some people are still preserving these traditional methods, but on the left, down left, you see that some people are also using some mechanic equipments to make it like 
uh, the uh, pearl of the uh, sago. And then after that, it's uh, become extracted to extract the, the sago itself. So this is a quite complex process. It takes days or even a week a week. It depends on the type of sago. And in Papua, they have their own sago types. It's not a cultivation sago. It's like an endowment of the nature given by them. So it's a very natural sago species that specifically grow there. And from sago, they make it into other types of food. Maybe some of you know papeda. It is something made of sago, but papeda is only one of very few example. Sago simoli, sago bronchong, to name a few types of food that coming are coming from sago. This is one of the types of one of the examples. It's not only in a form of dried sago. It's like in a form of like, uh, it's like a bit wet kind of sago pearls and there are some technologies that help the people in the village to turn the wet sago into dried sago it's one of the products of the mama mama is like the women in bofendigol district where pusaka is always working here together with the local people there they are under threats of the industrial forest plantations that belongs to one of the largest companies in Indonesia. And the customary land are being threatened because they, of course, the people are refused to take, to give away their lands because they know that their potential is in Sago. And they, it is their, the place where they live. The local sago powder is endemic from Bafandigo. And people know about that. And people like to have that kind of sago. And they are getting aware that they can uh, get uh, the niche of the market to market the sago products. And what I want to also would like to share with the sago making productions, with all of those figures, maybe you can also pay attention to this one. I want to highlight three points in this case. Women's productive work. Women is always deemed as the one who is not very productive. They only are able to do house chores, but actually they do more than that, the forest as the very most important sites for them is also the central of the women's life. So that's why it's, it is very important for the women to speak up about their rights and also their rights to the forest and also hunting and gathering's way of life. As I mentioned earlier, it is indicating a gender division of labor, gender division of works. If it is dominant, it is dominantly done by the women, but male are also contributing in this case. Male are helping in cutting down the trees because uh, considerably because it's, it's, it is huge in size, but women would say if the man wouldn't want to help us, we could do it ourselves. But well, anyway, in many cases, they would work together. And, and women usually would involve their daughters and they work in groups to uh, carry those uh, sago. So sago is only one of the potentials. There are a lot of carbohydrates sources they plant the plantations as the carp sources in the yards. And sometimes they also plant it inside the forest, within the forest itself. Well, because they preserve their forest, 
the amount of land are sufficient for them to grow plantains or bananas and also some others, uh, yams, yams, sorry. And what happened next? Well, actually there are three points in this case that I want to explain to you what happened with the food potentials in Papua context. First, maybe you can also read in the screen, Indonesianization agenda. Papua has a distinct history after the integration process it faced in 1969 through Pepera or Act of Free Choice, new or the regime, they tried to assimilate or integrate Papuan people into the whole Indonesian people. So the transmigration in massive way were taking place, even though it happened ever since uh, Netherlands or colonialism of the uh, Dutch, but it is it then uh, continued through the uh, modern era. Transmigration in this case is one of the most turning points where Papuans interacted with the migrants, especially those who were from Java and food uniformity was then introduced ever since the Papuan were introduced with rice because sago in this case is perceived as something is not very Indonesian because uh, Jawa is perceived, is deemed as the representations of Indonesia. And because of the transmigrations and the uh, interactions between the people, rice is introduced and Papua people are being, are introduced to the rice. I always interact in chit chatting, talking with the mama or the women, with the girls there. I often ask them and they said that they have left behind Sago, if they were not wrong, it's around 80s or 70s. It depends on the place, of course, but that's the story that they always repeat. And uh, I Priscilla, went back from you, Sorong you, Selatan or could, South could Sorong. You, could you please wrap up? Because we have last context. Yeah, yeah, the last okay. one. Okay, yeah. Jadi, dan konteks kedua itu, ya, selain and the second context, besides the Indonesian, Indonesianization context is the pressure on customary land by a large scale land based investment, palm oil, industrial forest plantation, food estates, and also other infrastructure projects that, of course, jeopardizing the sago hamlets of Papuan indigenous people, and also current additional context that is in this case COVID-19. And then uh, this is an urgent context that will trigger and will expand more the uh, large scale process. It's an old song, 10 years ago, one million hectares of land were converted to MIFE, Morocco Integrated Food and Energy Estate with the reason to respond a globe, the global food crisis. The same old song, same old reason were used also, COVID-19, the story now. And MIFE was, has been uh, resented uh, and rejected by the people, of course, because MIFE is very much corporate driven, large corporates and large groups are behind this and military backed up was there, of course. And in the process, it has problems with FBIC, unfair compensation and unfair, unjust compensation were there a lot. So MIFE has posed a lot of impacts, social impacts, environmental impacts, marginalization, poverty, and gender, gender disparity. And those impacts are lingering until today. And we found that there are lots of facts, lots of negative impacts that are still ongoing, are still experienced by the people. And nothing new under the sun, COVID-19 
is a, only a pretext, is the strongest pretext to run, to carry out the projects. It's not only in Papua. In Indonesia, we have Central Kalimantan, South Sumatra, North Sumatra, NTT. In Papua, it is expanding. It's not only in Merauke. Well, Fendigul and Mapi are two districts that will experience this with 2.6 million hectares for the food estates. And I think it's only focused on food. Yeah, maybe it might not be focused on energy, but the story is the same. The old song, old song as I mentioned before. And from all this series of struggling or the struggling is still ongoing amidst the oppression uh, experienced by the people to sweep away, to kind of uh, in include in this cultural and social and also formal struggles using the land, using the indigenous people values to fight against the corporate values and also formal struggle to, uh, to put forward how to also acknowledge their rights. And also besides that, how they could understand that they have lots of potentials of food by strengthening of local food. The youth and also the women are the actors on these struggles. And until today, they started to realize and even deeper, deeply understand that distribution uh, path and all the restrictions that are happenings. And from my conversations with colleagues in Papua amidst this pandemic, they decided to go back to to the forest because they think they are sure that the forest is the safest place because source of food is there in the forest. So during the COVID, the people there are going back to the forest. I think that's all that I can explain and share. Thank you so much. Good day and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you have you have uh, laid to us very important point on local food system, local struggle, and so the, the common. I think it is a common a property in the forest. I think we can hear more from also Kunubon. Uh, Kunubon, the floor is yours, please. The last speaker, Swadika. Good morning, friends. You can hear me okay, right? We have been with COVID-19 for two years. The, this uh, pandemic, I hope, has made us understand the importance of food much more. Because what in whatever crisis we face, we need to eat because we need because that's how we can live during lockdown the the, gov the the government allows our food transportation to continue uh, the bank of thailand the central bank has as made an assessment that because of covid situation 1.6 million people went back home in the rural areas, if you look at the this subdistrict uh, of of nine hundred uh, households, there were six hundred people that came back to this uh, subdistrict. Among these six hundred returnees, we found that they were they were taxi drivers. They were doing a massage. Uh, they, they, must, uh, they were being massaged and there were vendors uh, in the streets uh, at the train station. They, they had to come back home because they lost 
their job, there was no way they could earn income. And uh, some of them are, were also infected. So the community has to start doing, uh, managing uh, their, their problem in the uh, sub-district. So we had village health volunteers and the local uh, hospital uh, working very hard. And whatever, whether they have any budget from the government or not, they had to do it. They had to perform their duty, their roles. And the explanations uh, that the villagers said was that uh, people like us, uh, we all want to come back home to die. If, um, if we fear if we get infected, then we have to take care of each other. So it shows that villages, village communities are basically safety zones for all the uh, residents. And for those who moved out uh, to migrate to find jobs, they are still uh, tied uh, to the, uh, their, their hometown. So, and they also went to work in order to send income to their family. So basically the community is where they want to go to die. So it shows that this situation, uh, this concept is still uh, being maintained. Under the study uh, that of the sustainable Agriculture Foundation and the uh, Research Institute of Jula. There was a study on how food production was managed during COVID. 44.2% said they, were, they would increase food production. Then, then another 30% said they need to use their saving to buy food. And another uh, part uh, uh, was saying that they want to barter food with their neighbors. So basically they, uh, they were not worried at all about their food. They were very confident that they wouldn't have problems with food shortage, but their highest concern was income, cash income because COVID situation actually, re, re, for example, the taxi drivers uh, in town, they had to pay installment on their taxi uh, and that the students are still in, the, the, the children are still in school. So the loss of income actually of makes, uh, makes them very worried about what they're going to do in the future. When we ask what they're going to do in the future, most of them are waiting to get back to work, to get back to the same job, to earn income. And they explain that it's, it's not easy to, uh, to, to try to earn even a small income in the rural community, like even a hundred baht, it's not uh, possible. So overall in the country, the research says 10% of the people that go back uh, home want to try to earn a living or make a living in their own uh, home villages. Uh, particularly those who maybe have some savings uh, from their job in towns they try to start to do some business uh, uh, to, to become self-employed at home. Another phenomena is that the natural resources like forests and water, water uh, sources, they, these are being used more intensively. There were people coming from different districts, different provinces, to come and find, uh, collect uh, forest products. And these, these are actually private, pri privately owned forests, but uh, they had been used by the public. Uh, so, and they open to the public to gather forest uh, non-timber products. But 
the COVID situation made the landowners or the forest owners uh, trying to exert their control more on the on the forest. They want to to show that they were they are the owner of the forest. There are several reasons for this. The maybe because the price of mushrooms uh, gathered in the forest has gone up. And there were people from outside of town, outside of another province, who they don't know uh, coming to collect mushroom in the, the private forest. That's one of the situation we found. Similarly, uh, similar to Malaysia, the market, uh, there's problem in the market. For rice market, uh, uh, the, the price of uh, jasmine rice has actually not uh, has has not reached ten thousand baht, only eight to nine thousand baht. This has been going on for two years, and the the company that does the export uh, exporting of rice said that they could not afford uh, the cost of transportation of shipment, which has gone up two or three times. Uh, to ship to other countries overseas. That's why the price uh, in the local market has come down. And for, for along the border with Cambodia, uh, the COVID situation has closed the markets along the border. So uh, vendors there and, and then local chickens from the Thai, uh, the Northeastern uh, region of Thailand can which used to be sold uh, in the Cambodian market across the border. Once the market is closed, they could not send the chickens to be sold. So the price of chickens have come down. Yeah. So the, now these are the impact that has seen in the local areas and also in the local market and domestic market. Uh, that's all I want to uh, uh, exchange with you at the moment. Uh, I think what we learned from uh, maybe uh, Sochiet so and Basela could add a little bit more, but later about the focusing on the impact of the this epidemic to the food production to the small scale farmers and food system. But I, I would like to sum up a, li a little bit what I've heard. So when we're talking about the food system, we, we're meaning that food production, food distribution, and consumption. And I think uh, this, this food system has been affected very much from the epidemic. But we can see very clear from at least Punubon and Amir have said, and also uh, Sochiet has mentioned a little bit that the local food system has been affected a lot less than the monoculture crops that produce for the long distance market. And this is, this is something that we learn together here. That is the, the local food system has been very much resilient to the crisis. And I think people was maybe will be said also that, also resilient to the climate change, also resilient to the COVID-19. And I think we'll be resilient to a lot of crisis to come. As we are, we are going to live with crisis from now on. And, and I think we, we need to pay very much attention to how we could build, strengthen the local food system. I think Amir also have left the, the issue there that we discuss later. And, and the, the, the we're, very uh, clear impact also another point is that people got lost a job, lost money or less money they have in, in the pocket. Then the food security come from different, me different means. Mostly now come from uh, common property or the property that hasn't claimed by the owner yet, but it start to claim more as people mentioned. So the forest, the common land become, become a 
I think it's a kind of social buffer that people could rely on. Also get income and also get food from that kind of common land, common property. And it's very clear by Amir saying that the very centralized food system has been a problem for a long time and adding to this situation, adding to, to the existing uh, uh, situation, like the monoculture, monopolization, the centralization, and then the epidemic occur, is adding to the crisis. And it's very clear that the centralized food system or monopolized food system, industrialized food system, has no answer to the people's survival. And then adding to that, the situation that has been very, very, uh, how to say, problematic in India, in Indonesia, like the, the, the land consolidation, the cooperation, co cooperatize on land and try to even further introduce the, the mega project using land, big, huge land, and taking away the local food system, local, local food culture that been very resilient and then, then also even furthermore uh, suppressed women's role and, and uh, in, uh, integrity in the food system. So this is what we heard from, from uh, our speaker. So I think it is, it is important that we need to also discuss all of that how could we, how could we call for attention and building this local food system to become more present, important, realized, and also less problem to, to less trouble making trouble to, to that system. And I would like to also hear from uh, from the from the audience, from friends, okay, comments and, and, and question, and then I will give the prop back. And I would love to hear more in, focusing on impact from Cambodia and also. Uh, Indonesia. Any comments, any question to, to the speaker, please. The floor is open. Silence. Then we have more time for our speaker. Any, any comments? The organizer, would you like to add something or question? Friends? And the story from, from Malaysia is also very interest, very interesting that the, the, the inputs become increasingly increasing price, food price also increasing, the people have less money in where the market. It seems like the, 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 the people who got job loss, less money in the pocket, could not get access at all to to food in the market. So maybe they have food from somewhere else. I think that is also interesting that how could people survive under this situation? And I would like to add as, as my, my also I'm working on, on the agriculture food system. It's been very clear, for example, here in Thailand that the people more, consumer more concerned and aware to the healthy food. In, in, in Thailand, the, the green market has been, the, the customer in the green market has been more than double increasing in every green market. So people were, have been a lot looking for food that healthy. Okay, with the epidemic. Okay, if no question or comments. Couldn't, couldn't, like to... couldn't get we have a questions. Okay. Can can, can you, you check the, can you please. introduce yourself to... No, can you check the line please? There's a questions for you. Oh sorry. Oops. Sorry, sorry. Oh, 
Okay, I will read. So the question to speaker from Thailand and Cambodia. That's for top model in Thailand or OVOP, I don't know, OVOP in Cambodia help to promote domestic agriculture and sustainability of food. And another question is, the access to affordable and quality food is also the consumer's problem. How producer and consumer could reach out to each other. So this is the forever question. And another question is, do you see urban consumer becoming more aware of the, or conscious of the food system? Amidst the COVID-19, do you see any collaboration happening that could be inspiring model to other contexts? If no consumer involvement at all, why do, we, why do you think it happened that way? So, quite a lot of question. So, let's start with the first OTOP, OTOP, one top one, one product, and OVOP, Cambodia promote domestic agriculture and sustainability of food. Kun Won and Sosyet. And Amir, could you please Hopefully read you also the chat? Yes, I have uh, the most vulnerable uh, people in the COVID situation. Uh, are the urban, uh, are the workers, are the poor workers who work in the service sector in cities because they can only access food uh, from the income that they earn every day. So when the COVID situation placed a lockdown uh, order uh, by the government, these people cannot uh, access food. So I have heard that there are now uh, uh, that, that the group of people called the immediately poor. So they become suddenly poor. Uh, these are the urban workers uh, who actually need to be uh, to be looked at in order to prepare them for situations, this kind of situations in the future. I think we need to ensure the saving systems uh, of the workers uh, who work in cities. And also we need to reconsider the uh, state welfare system because right now there is no state welfare measures that can actually respond quickly to the lack of food uh, among the urban workers. And these have to be a system that actually can respond quickly to a situation uh, when uh, people actually uh, uh, cannot access food. What has happened is was that groups of people, volunteers kind of pulled the, the food together. It happened in every province, in the towns, in every province. Uh, people got together to trying to bring the food to donate to people, or they, they, they leave it for people to take. But the thing is, there is no system to actually look at uh, in, in each uh, locality what type of food uh, are available in the local area, what types of food are being brought from outside, and if we have a problem, how can we, what types of uh, food should we, production should we strengthen in order to ensure the local food security? So I think food security management has to be done uh, uh, up uh, be, the, in the best way is at the kind of the sub district level at a community level, so that all the community community members have to look at where uh, they have been getting their food and how they can ensure that they can continue to get their food. I think we need to start it now in each town. Important is the role 
or the involvement of consumer, urban consumer, and how and so as to question about the consumer, did they aware more of the situation of the food system than that they learn and understand more food system and how could they get involved and did did we see any um, how to say project or model that linking both of producer and consumer and, and try to, to go about the sustainability of food system. So I think the the pandemic has really uh, shown uh, realities uh, to the consumers. One thing is the uh, unfair uh, unfair distribution uh, spaces because it seems that the local markets, fresh markets, get closed one if there are some kind of infected uh, people there, but large department stores and supermarkets remain open there during the pandemic. And I heard there were people who tried to gather donations from others and to and then use the money to buy food from the farmers in the rural areas because farmers cannot sell their produce. And these groups buy the food from the farmers and bring it to the urban uh, poor. I think the, the uh, from what happened, you can say that a lot, some group of consumers are becoming more aware and actually has taken action to ensure uh, that uh, they can actually provide uh, the link between producer and consumers. And, but, and this should actually show society that here is a better uh, system for food security to ensure food security. I hope that the consumers uh, in our society learn something this actually it's still going on the the activity is still going on in the Konkan uh, city there are con uh, consumers group that are connecting the farmers outside uh, with the urban dwellers so they still continue their activities and i hope that this is a way that they can see the benefit of having shorter supply chain and the supply chain that is around uh, within the same area. Discussion, there's a question for you in the chat asking about the, how would the government react to food dump? Did they try to help distribute the product that been dumped by the okay. media man? All right. Uh, actually, uh, the government actually worked uh, quite late, uh, but the NGOs actually the one who uh, really fast at uh, doing things uh, during the pandemic, where they uh, work together with this producer, with uh, this uh, uh, vegetables producer to distribute uh, uh, unsold vegetables eh, because of the transportation problem to the area where uh, people need it the most. Uh, later, a uh, few few weeks uh, after that, uh, then the government is actually announced uh, what uh, they call it as pasas uh, gar kawal or a control a wet market. So the, the issues here is to control the COVID infection. So uh, the the wet market has been closed uh, because of the infection. So uh, to prevent this to to, to prevent this and to uh, to make sure that the product is is uh, continued to be sold, then the government uh, uh, set up this uh, uh, controlled uh, wet markets uh, all over the country, and uh, is it actually not uh, uh, it it helps but not uh, not really uh, successful in in term of uh, before the pandemics where the I mean the produce is uh, can be sold uh, directly to the, to the consumers uh, within the same day. Uh, 
uh, I would like to take this opportunity to also uh, re-emphasize uh, the point that uh, Mr. Ubon said uh, that the village community is actually uh, more resilient uh, in, in uh, managing the, the COVID-19 situations. So uh, in my opinion, it's actually uh, we need to uh, practice uh, precautions uh, by uh, implementing like a, a multi-level uh, framework to support uh, food security at uh, be beginnings at our home first, and then the community and nationals and and group and global. So the shorter supply chain in the uh, in the uh, food supply uh, is uh, better uh, instead of uh, we sell it to other. Region to other area in the, in the longer uh, transportation is a longer. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you know, everyone at hope should should uh, know how to plan something. You know, so there are so many ways to plan. You know? So in, in your backyard, even in a pot, if you live in an apartment, so actually it's you yourself to change uh, the way you eat. I mean, the, your eating pattern, you, you need to eat more local foods uh, instead of imported foods. Uh, I mean, if uh, your country produce uh, rice, you should eat more rice uh, rather than uh, wheat. Yeah? And, and of course, uh, an individual actually cannot uh, plant everything. So, so there come the community. So when, when the community uh, work together, uh, like in the, in the village community, then uh, they can exchange harvest, uh, they can exchange seeds. Uh, so this is important uh, to make sure that the food availability, availability for all is, is there. And there are, there are many, uh, many areas in Malaysia supported by the government is actually uh, open up more uh, community garden. And they, they call it community garden where the local authorities uh, set up a uh, Idle lands where the land that has not been used uh, to be uh, to be used as a, a shared uh, space uh, for community to plant. So this is this is something that uh, I think uh, need to be done uh, more widely. So uh, on the other hand, uh, the consumers actually should should uh, support local producer and and should support. Uh, local input pro product provider, so uh, should buy from them and, and make use of local supply as much as as we can. Uh, so in this way, the community as a whole uh, will work as a social support to the vulnerable peoples within within the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Okay, uh, we have come to almost the end. Of but I, I would like to, to add a little, please, to you, please allow me that I will be gone scheduled uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so, so I, I would like to hear from Sosiet and also Rosella. And you have uh, the last round for you. Man, Kunchiran, King Kong. Uh, send to the uh, excuse me okay I would like to also uh, uh, share with you about uh, the general understanding and the response or promotion in regarding to the protection of food system in, in Cambodia. I would like to share two trends uh, or maybe two movements which is uh, somehow some kind of very contradict uh, happening in Cambodia. Uh, the first trend I would like to exp to say with you that uh, in general, uh, the government of Cambodia are in partnership, in very strong partnership with the private sectors 
and cooperation to promote uh, a modern, a new uh, food system which is uh, being controlled by cooperation, which is taking away of uh, food sovereignty. For the other trend, we can see that there's a small numbers of uh, farmer movement and networks, which is not only work to promote uh, food security, but we are too trying to promote food sovereignty because uh, we understand that food sovereignty is only the alternative to to sustain uh, uh, our food system. And this means that there's a movement of trying to promote agroecology farming in order to protect our local food system. Food sovereignty here mean, is mean that uh, not only to protect food system, but we're trying to put, uh, to protect our uh, independent powers on the farmers to really control the, the whole food system from uh, in regard to owning the seeds. The farmer need to own the seed, need to own the market, need to own the whole process of the farming. So we actually, there's, there's an actually a movement to, to really uh, transform a systematic transform on food system. Farmers uh, start to understand that the current model of food system, the current modernization of food system is not safe, it's not sustained, and it has been always in a crisis and it's really collapsing. And we, the majority, especially the small farmers, are the, the one who always lost. The corporation always win in the current system. So there's a movement, uh, there's a movement to really uh, transform the, the, the current modern food system to protect the uh, uh, local food system by, again, promoting agroecologies to ensure uh, food sovereignty. The government and the corporation is, is lying us. They are lying us that corporation are the one who feed, who, are, who have enough capacity to feed the world, to feed us uh, uh, safe, but actually they are lying. So people have, like farmers are, are learning this and we are trying to get out of the trap that they are playing game with us. Okay. But I think it's there's, clear. there's challenge and there's still a big struggle. And actually the network and mostly the, 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 the small farmers and uh, small food producers, we are them, we are ourselves trying to, 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 uh, to struggle together because we, we need to we need to join our force to transform the system. We okay, cannot come. depend on and wait for the corporation and the government to to do it for us. So we actually need to work together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lasela, please. Two minutes, please. Uh in, in, in English, or is, is there any translation for Indonesia? Still? He's still here. If you can speak English. Yeah, that's okay. Better. Okay, my main recommendations, uh, my, my main recommendation related to the issue of, uh, yeah, food security or food. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, our, in the issue of uh, food, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The issue of food security and the uh, food uh, sovereignty is that uh, uh, the government uh, have to try to respect and and rec recognize the rights of 
uh, indigenous people and start to look back the potentials of local food and also uh, uh, stop uh, the, the, the investment that harm the rights of indigenous people, especially their, their land rights because it's uh, and, and because it's only uh, harm the, the future of the forest uh, as their uh, source of life and also uh, uh, another recommendations that is quite important is to uh, that's quite urge is uh, to ratify the the law of indigenous uh, uh, the law of uh, indigenous people so that the, the, so that uh, the, the indigenous people could secure their rights uh, including land rights and also another traditional rights yeah i think this this kind of recommendations that i could say uh, today thank you thank you very much yeah i think it's um so sorry for everyone that we have so limited time but i think this discussion this very important discussion will be going on under in these several platforms. But so far as I could try to sum up the recommendation that, that, that we, we were discussing here, is that the local food system or the district, as could one say, the district or provincial system on food security need to be set up and built and strengthened. So it, it, whatever crisis come, it need to be prepared at that level, not the national level. I think this is the uh, first one. The second so far that I can get up, um, it's an opportunity that the consumer has learned and aware to the situation on, on food system problem, on food system, food monopolizing, and also uh, maybe about the food for health something. So it's the time that we could find way to, to, to get to make a link, close closer link between producers, small scale producer and consumer. So I mean I used to, to, the term, we could try to find a way to shorten this, the food supply chain and get more consumer involvement. Get people learn how to produce food and they could understand more food system. And also I think I've heard. The, the, the kind of model when, when, when thinking of what is the food system model that, that we want. Maybe it's a community-based practicing. Community-based practicing doesn't mean that it's in the rural area, in the village level, but also we can build a community anywhere, also in the urban area that people use the kind of com community concept, the sharing, controlling, and, and, and uh, how to say, balancing power and managing it together on what crisis to come and also producing food, distribute food and, and consume good food. So I think this is very, very clear and good recommendation that heard. And I think the last important issue is that we need to make it clear together that is as much as we can that the existing corporate food system is the one who created the crisis and it is cannot cope with crisis or respond to any crisis. So we have to make it clear that it's no longer promoted and try to struggle together and promote the local food system instead of that corporate food system. I think we come to an end. Thank you everyone to be with us till now in this in Sunday afternoon. Have a good week. Have a good evening. Not going to party yet because we are still in social distancing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the every Thank you for the translator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Kun King Gong, and hope you drive safe and approach okay, home yeah, before yeah. the curfew time. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. So, uh, and also, bye -bye. thank you to all the panelists and to give us a lot of re good recommendations to take away. I hope all the audience will enjoy it. And now we're coming to the last sessions of today, uh, which is about the film. And the film that we're going to show today is titled When, and it is an award-winning documentary 
produced by four filmmakers from Myanmar in 2016 by Human Dignity Film Institute, which is a film produ production house for a number of good documentary films that reflect the actual situation and life of the peoples. Uh, for your note, uh, this film will only show on the English channel of mail. So for those who are watching the Thai channel of mail right now, can you, uh, you may need to follow us on the English channels. And before we going to show you this, the film, uh, please join me. Thank you to all the audience uh, for your kind attending to our online conference. And thank you to all panelists and moderator and the filmmaker of today. And we will see you again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Bangkok, Thailand's time. And we will stay on the part two of the mail, the crisis in actions. And thank you everyone and enjoy the film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.